tell us how you came to how you, the circuitous path that got you into the district attorney's yeah. office and why you're running for re-election and why the guardian should endorse you. We know where we are on the issues. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I want to start by saying that, that I really believe that this is a great opportunity. Uh, you have a, arguably one of those most progressive chief of police with a long history of endorsing progressive causes at the national level and at the local level that now has an opportunity to become a district attorney uh, in a very unique form. And, you know, you have basically, you have had two institutions that often have not worked together well. And you have the opportunity to bring that together under the umbrella of someone that has a proven track of being very progressive. Because not only is it important for public safety to have a good relationship, but it's also important to maintain, uh, to ensure that you have constitutional policing, that you have a constitutional system that is working um, within, within the county. And this is a, really a unique opportunity, uh, and, and frankly, one that I think that can actually lead to, to the creation of things that haven't been seen there before. Uh, if you look at my history, uh, you look at it, and I want to start actually here in San Francisco, and then I'm going to go back and forth. But, you know, a lot of people are talking about Brady. A lot of people talk about the crime lab. But what is often not talked about is that I am the one that brought the problems with the San Francisco crime lab to the public. I became aware of it within less than five hours. I was doing a press conference, and I shut down the controlled substances of the lab. I contacted then Jerry Brown, who was the attorney general. I brought other people in to take a look, and it was George Gascon. It was not anybody else the one that brought this to light, even though there have probably been issues with the crime lab that dated back many years and other people were aware of a piece of this, you know, it was I, the one that brought it up. The other thing is that, you know, we talk about Brady, and, you know, there's a lot of discussions about Brady, but again, what is not being talked about is that it was George Gascon, the one that realized that the county did not have a formal Brady policy, had the discussion with the uh, with then uh, district attorney, Kamala Harris, and we immediately, in the police department, went on to create a Brady policy, negotiated with the union for over a year, and put what is probably one of the most comprehensive Brady policies in the country. We also took a 30-year look back, which is completely unprecedented, of every personnel of the police department to make sure that if we have all problems, that they will be brought forward. Then you fast forward to the district attorney's office, and it is, again, George Gascon, the one that comes in and creates a trial integrity unit. One of the few trial integrity units in the country out of the DA's office. And immediately, when we have a problem like the Henry Hotel, it is I, the one that made the determination immediately to turn information over to the public defender's office by the bundles and dismiss a bunch of cases because I saw the problems with the cases. So when you hear about you know, the, the, the chief of police and all the problems that happened under his watch and all the stuff, what everybody forgets to look at is that it's actually all this is public information today because I am the one that brought it forward and I'm the one that has started dealing with it very aggressively. But let me give you a little more because I think it's important for you to realize that there are 33 years of history here in history with significant accomplishments not only in providing public safety, but in doing the right things for the right reasons. You know, I, I'm an immigrant. I came here when I was 13 years old. I was a, a non-English speaker. I actually dropped out of high school. Um, you know, I struggled. I'm the first person in my family to get a college degree. I came from a blue-collar family. Um, and Where were you born? I was born in Cuba Okay. Yeah. And, and was raised in L.A. Came mm -hmm. here when I was 13 years old. Um, I, you know, I, I had the, a lot of the problems that the young kids have when you're racing in very poor neighborhoods with a lot of problems. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I got, a, you know, some people believed in me and helped me. And obviously I eventually got, you know, graduated from school, went, went in the Army, went to college, went to law school. But, but it was a bumpy road, you know. So I understand how people in those situations uh, can go either way. So when I joined the LAPD, one of the things that I did immediately was I wanted to work in the very same type of places that I was racing. And, and then I developed a history of involving myself in the communities, working with young people, and going all the way through the ranks until I became the number two person in the LAPD, dealing with immigration issues at the same time that we were lowering crime and working very closely with our communities. I then 
during my stand there when the Rampart scandal occurred. I was the one that actually was trusted with putting together the training for an entire police department, basically all the sworn members, over 9,000 people, and actually posting the Bill of Rights in every training room. And in fact, at the time, uh, the LA Weekly, which is a, a parent uh, company of the SF Weekly, mm -hmm. there's this incredible article about you know the LAPD and myself in, in, in posting the Bill of Rights and what we were doing to provide constitutional training to the Critical police. Piece. No, a piece, uh, 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 yeah, which was very unusual for the LA Weekly to actually write anything positive about the police yeah. department. And they, did <laughs> this, yeah. and they did this very extensive piece yeah. because we invited them to come to the classrooms and to look at what was being taught. And we brought in not only the, uh, the uh, U.S. attorney, but we brought in the union and we brought in some civil rights lawyer to put together the curriculum for that training. Fast forward to 2006, I get recruited. I go to Mesa, Arizona, the third largest city uh, in the state of Arizona. I get there and I immediately confront, quite frankly, a very toxic anti-immigrant environment where immigrants were being blamed for everything that went wrong and sometimes for things that weren't even wrong. And I knew because I have been in the business for so long and have been working in immigrant communities that a lot of the things that were being blamed on immigrants were untruth. Immigrants are not necessarily any more likely to commit crimes than anyone else. In fact, often they are less likely to commit crimes, and I knew that because I know that the data is there to support that. So I went on to prove that, and while we were reducing crime in Mesa, I was taking on the Minutemen, I was taking on Joe Arpaio, the sheriff of Maricopa County, I was taking on Russell Pierce, who is now uh, going through a, uh, a recall, which in fact Matt and I were just talking, he's the guy that was sort of the, the architect behind SB 1070. I wrote about it. I have pieces published not only locally, locally but at the New York Times. Then I even provided testimony in Congress, and I was told that I was going to be terminated by doing so. Um, I was the first one, and actually never had a history of creating an LGBT forum in the Mesa Police Department, a community forum, because I knew that was one or the many communities that was underserved. And, and people talked against doing that. And this is, you have to understand, this is one of the most conservative communities in the country, right? Fast forward, then I get into San Francisco. I come in, and when I get hired, one of my commitments is that there are a lot of problems. And quite frankly, 2008 was a very brutal year in the city of San Francisco. There were 97 murders. I come in, and within 18 months, we bring our murder rate from nearly 100 to 47 and 50 in two years. Uh, one of the lowest rates, in fact, you have to go back to 1961 to find similar rates. At the same time that I put community police advisory boards in every station, created community forums, including an LGBT forum, an African American forum, and many other forums to work with me, and started working on developing different protocols within the police department. When this opportunity came up for me to become the DA, frankly, it was not one that I was seeking. But one of the things when it was presented, I immediately called people that I work with. And I have been working for years with the Kennedy School of Government, for instance, where I have worked with several other people about what should the criminal justice system look 20, 30 years down the line. I talked to people that I trust greatly that I have been working for years, and everybody said, you know, George, this is a tremendous opportunity to do something that has never occurred before. And that is bring a progressive chief of police with tremendous information and background in looking at the criminal justice system very globally and put him in the DA's office where you actually control the policy, what is going to be prosecuted, how is it going to be prosecuted. And then when I got the job, I immediately wanted to reorganize the office. We started looking at taking a lot of low-level offenses and put them into a restorative justice model at the neighborhood court level. We started looking at offenses that are being driven by mental illness and drug abuse and looking for ways to increase the use of current drug court and mental health court. At the same time, they're attending to violent crime and trying to dispose of the backlog of homicide cases by settling cases where appropriate and prosecuting other cases were not. Also, moving victim services into the community. So we started with the Bayview and the Mission, and now we're looking to put it in Chinatown, putting victim services out there because we know that usually the most vulnerable victims are not going to come and avail themselves of the system. Going after waste theft, going after elderly abuse, working with the YMCA to create more bandwidth for after school programs, working with the school district to continue to reduce recidivism by creating a different model when we work with kids to transition from middle school into high school, 
that already are having attendance problems and performance problems and creating a different model so that they can be acclimated to the school community and they stay there and they actually graduate from school. These are the things that I have been doing already in a very short period of time. Now working on legislation to create a sentencing commission, dealing with realignment, when nobody was even talking about realignment in January this year, dealing with realignment already and leading the charge at the statewide level uh, in order to deal with this, which I believe is an opportunity, but it's a complex one that is going to have a lot of moving parts. Again, I think there is a, a tremendous opportunity here that is not being talked about, and I hope that you would be able to pierce through that veil and look behind the curtain.